All right, thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, this is episode two, season four of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. I'm your host this evening, Andrew de Bloch, coming to you live from Johannesburg. Um, so this is episode two of season uh, four, as I mentioned, but we do have 120 episodes recorded and available on YouTube. So if you do miss out because of load shedding or your Tuesday nights have gotten busy with in-person events, never fear, you can always catch up on our YouTube channel. So tonight we are delving into a slightly different topic, uh, although we stay with the theme of winged flying creatures. We are comparing butterflies and birds tonight, so something a bit different and a bit fresh for conservation conversations. Please remember that you can use the Zoom chat and the Q&A feeds or the Facebook comment feed if you're watching us there to communicate with the hosts and panelists. Uh, we will answer questions during the discussion at the end of this webinar. Just to let you know, we also have some amazing Bird of the Year merchandise on sale at Shop the Birds, our online store, including adorable fluffies. So be sure to buy yours via BirdLife's lovely online store. That's shop.birdlife.org.za. Um, I know last webinar two weeks ago was our opening webinar for the year on the Cape Parrot and received rave reviews. So I'm hoping those will translate into some awesome merchandise sales, which of course, support BirdLife South Africa and our conservation work on the species and others. Of course, we're also on all social media channels and you can use the hashtag conservation conversations as well as BirdLife South Africa to let us know what you think of the show. Please do chat with us on there. So we do aim to keep these webinars free for everyone to learn and enjoy, but we do incur costs running the show. So if you enjoy the series and are able to contribute, no matter how small that might be, please visit the Cricket page or EFT Bird Life South Africa directly and use the reference webinars and your name so that we can track those donations. And um, thank you so much to those of you who do continue to support us. Uh, we appreciate it greatly. Have you booked your spot for Flock the Wilderness in 2023 yet? This promises to be an incredible event full of exciting birding excursions, top speakers, a showcase in quality ornithological research and a gathering of passionate bird enthusiasts. The event will take place at the Wilderness Hotel from the 24th to the 28th of May 2023 and bookings are now open via the Bird Life Africa website. The spots are limited, so be sure to book yours soon to avoid missing out. Bird Life Africa's AGM will also take place on the Saturday with a luncheon after the meeting for all in attendance. Um, be sure to visit our website to find out any more details. The biennial Learn About Birds conference hosted with Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology will also take place during Flock to the Wilderness. Now, BirdLife South Africa and Outland Escape Tours have joined together to organize the 2023 Hiking and Biking for Birds Adventure Series, with six events happening at six different locations across South Africa throughout 2023. The money raised from these events will come to the Empowering People and Regional Conservation Program, so it's hiking and biking for a good cause. And the events will alternate between hiking and biking. And it's not aimed at being strenuous, but rather an enjoyable and different way to find out about the special birds in each of these locations. So do please email Christy Wooding. Her email is at the bottom of the slide there, and I will put it in the chat box uh, once Steve has got going as well. Um, spots are limited on each of these events, so do book early um, to avoid disappointment. Uh, as a bonus, there will be a bird life South Africa representative um, on each of these events, and um, I think I'm being assigned to one or two of them even as well. So if you want to put yourself through a long weekend uh, with me on the back of a saddle, um, do make sure that you book up for one of the biking events or alternatively one of the hiking events if uh, going on foot is more your thing. So on to tonight's presentation. We're very privileged to be joined by the South African butterfly guru, Steve Woodhall. Um, Steve has lived in South Africa since immigrating from the UK in 1990, and he spent a lot of that time since then chasing butterflies, um, at first with a net and now with a camera. Um, Steve's just upgraded to an R7 and was showing me some of his photographs, and they're phenomenal. He has authored or edited several books during that time, um, most notably The Field Guides to the Butterflies of South Africa, published by Straight Nature, which is now in its second edition, um, and he's also produced an app of the same name. So if you are enthused by this webinar, go and buy the book and the app on the App Store. Um, Steve was president of the Lepidopterist Society of Africa for eight years and saw the beginnings of citizen science with Lepimap, um, Sanvi and the ADU being the partners there. 
More recently, he's been using iNaturalist and he's currently championing the Etequini City Nature Challenge 2023 with Sandy. Um, Steve has all sorts of other projects up his sleeve, but um, tonight he's going to be talking to us about the parallels between birds and butterflies. It's a presentation I've been lucky to see once. Uh, I believe he has given it at the BirdLife Etiquini KZN Club as well, um, although it's a bit fresher um, since then. So I'm very happy to welcome Steve to the platform. Um, Steve, the floor is yours. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and, and let you take us away and tell us all about um, us bird enthusiasts in the audience tonight, why we should also be paying attention to butterflies. Thank you, Andrew. Let me just share the screen here. Okay, here we go. Um, can you all see that? No, uh, not just yet. Sorry? Not just there we yet. go. Zoom and it's... To, there we go. You should be able to see it. No, there we go. There we right. go. Okay. Thank you, everybody. And thank, and thank you, Andrew, for organising this and letting me come along and, uh, and talk to all about butterflies and birds and the, how they have parallels, which they have a lot. I notice there's a few people in the audience tonight who I, I know are already um, both butterflies and birders. So welcome, guys and girls. Nice to have you here. So let's just start off then. Um, so here we have butterflies and birds. It's a fun way of looking at parallels because there's a lot of fun to have with birds and butterflies. And let's start off here with, with um, what do these two creatures have in common? Um, bird at the top and the butterfly at the bottom. The bird was photographed at Giba Gorge near me in Hillcrest on that bridge, going along a stream through one of the gorges. And the butterfly, it's Giba Gorge Bridge, the butterfly was photographed on top of the Plattberg near Harrisbeth um, years ago. I think, I think one of you was actually with me that day. Um, we actually managed to get a Subaru to the top. And on that mountain, we found a butterfly. Well, first of all, the mountain wagtail, which flies like Beaver Gorge, always found out in these, these mountain streams. And then, of course, the Table Mountain Beauty, the Rapatees of Larkia, which we um, uh, photographed that day on, on, on top of, um, of um, on top of the uh, Plattberg at, at Harry Smith, uh, feeding, on, feeding on these yellow or orange Nifophia flowers, which she's very fond of. And those of you living in Cape Town will probably be familiar with this butterfly. I noticed a, a couple of people, a couple of the audience tonight said it's their favorite butterfly. It happens to be the only pollinator of the red Deza orchid, Deza uniflora. And I've never managed to photograph one of those actually pollinating the red Deza yet, but they are a spectacular sight. So that, that's the sort of thing we're talking about here tonight, what they're having, what they have in common, which is not necessarily obvious, but just starting off here, what fascinates about both groups of creatures? Well, first of all, Bright colours, you get beautifully coloured butterflies, beautifully coloured birds, difficult identifications. Some of them, you know, we've got LBJs in birds, we've got LBJs in butterflies as well, which can really be a challenge. Then they tend to have engaging or strange habits, uh, behaviour which which makes you scratch your head a little bit and think, hmm, what's going on there? You know? And then sometimes the, the, the butterflies' behaviour and birds' behaviour are, are interlinked because, of course, butterflies and the, the caterpillars and moths, of course, form the bottom of the of the trophic pyramid. They feed, feed on plants and then obviously form uh, uh, protein um, and carbohydrates. And of course, birds eat them and feed them to their to their young and eat them themselves. So that's where you know the two link together within within an ecosystem quite strongly. Majestic appearance. There are some butterflies which just strike you as being particularly um, beautiful looking or or very um, uh, attractive when flying. And also, of course, there are other rarities. As uh, I know, a lot of people will know people twitch birds, but they also twitch butterflies. And uh, I've done some crazy 3,500 kilometer journeys in the search of butterflies as well. I know a lot of birders up for birds. So let's start off with, with bright colors. Of course, brilliant blues are one of the sort of most popular color schemes in nature. And here's a couple of examples here the half colored kingfisher and the black bellied starlings. And both of these were photographed. Near where I live, the uh, Palming Nature Reserve with the Kingfisher, and my old uh, working site at Hammersdale, where we get the black bellied star starlings. And beautiful blue bluebirds, which are very spectacular and, and fun to photograph. Of course, with butterflies, blue butterflies are, and I noticed uh, somebody tonight said that the, um, the um, southern sapphire is a favorite butterfly. There's a, a beautiful male southern sapphire. 
And then we have these other ones, the fig, common fig tree blue, which is found more or less all over Southern Africa, even in the desert. The brilliant giant cupid, which is not quite so widespread, but it is found all the way along the mountain chain, virtually from, from, the, from the Western Cape right up into KZN. And of course, there's a Caraxes. There's always a beautiful blue Caraxes around, and that's the blue spotted Caraxes. Let's have a look where you find these. Well, this is a place called Spitzkop in Lowlands in KZN. And there's a couple of uh, a butterfly and bird of four by fours in the distance there. And that those lumps of, of sandstone rubble are very good butterfly spots. And you get that, that particular blue there, um, the, uh, the, the start of a brilliant giant cupid. The Caraxes is uh, found in the lowland forests around the coast and up into the, the very low forests of the of the old uh, eastern Transvaal, um, Pumalanga and, and Popo, which stand up there as well. And it's, it's a lowland forest butterfly. Zimbabwe is a good spot for them. And I sort of blush to say I get them in my garden here in Gillets, just showing off there. Fig tree blue. Well, it's called the fig tree blue because the caterpillars eat fig leaves. And there's one of, one of my butterfly uh, 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 friends uh, climbing up towards a, a red leaf rock pig uh, in the Machalisberg, which is a particularly good place to find those butterflies. And then, of course, the, the, the southern sapphire, there's one of its favorite spots, forest edges in, uh, along the coast from roughly from the Eastern Cape around uh, sort of south of East London, um, up into, up into uh, the, the Natal. And they, 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 they sort of turn into another butterfly around about the Tegela Valley, which is very similar called the straight line sapphire. But one of the best places to see them is as the edge of Ngoi Forest. You walk along the edge there, you see these beautiful blue things whizzing around the, the canopy. So more bright colours, red shafts. There's a on the on the left there, we've got black coloured barbus, Libius torquatus, that was spreading after the, uh, another bird, a friend of mine who sadly deceased now, Peter Webb. I went to stay with him and he had a lot of birds in his garden. This particular one came along and, and uh, showed off in front of me. I got a picture of him. And then the Southern Red Bishop, you collect these oryx, and that's uh, the Saint Andrew. I've just got an R7 with a with the um, uh, 100 to 400 RF lens. And I walked straight out of Camera Tech's offices and saw this the beautiful bishop on, a, on the reed bed right outside Camera Tech. And I just couldn't resist it. I started taking photographs. That's almost the first photograph I took with my new camera. I'm so impressed. With it. The, uh, the sharpness and the, and, and the contrast and the colour rendition is just amazing. That's, a, that's my plug for Canon for the night. Um, okay, red butterflies. We've got a lot of red butterflies all over the world, not just in South Africa. They're, they're found in everywhere you go, more or less, you've got red butterflies. Three examples here. Orange barred Playboy, that's one of the Lycinidae. They, they, they tend to feed on, uh, the caterpillars feed on seeds of plants like the, um, 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 what do they call it? The, ah, yeah. Um, I forgot the name of the plant. It's, it's the one with the pots. Uh, yeah, anyway, ask me later. Uh, that one you find quite often in, in, the, in, in, the, in the forest edges around, around the eastern side of South Africa. Pride of the Carp, that's the host plant. Pride of the Carp, it feeds on the pods of that. Then you've got Boys of Vals Falsacra, the Pseudoco Boys of Vali form Calvali. It's got two forms. The one form has got orange wing tips, and the other form has got, has got clear wing tips. It mimics two different forms of Africa. Mimicry is very common amongst, amongst butterflies. And you can see here, we've got a blood red acre, which is a butterfly, which is which has got toxins in it. Caterpillars feed on, on, the, on plants that are, that are um, distasteful to herbivores. And the butterflies have evolved to uh, kidnap those uh, or utilize those plant toxins to make themselves distasteful to, 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 to insect predators. And that one is nectaring on a particularly lovely plant we get down here in Kia today called blue haze, which is. Um, uh, Tetris Lego uh, Natalensis. And wherever you find that flower, you're going to get good butterflies. And then at the top left, we've got Axisocius chuani, the eastern scarlet. Caterpillars feed on on, uh, on various members of the Abaceae, Bacchelia and, and Senegalia, and also some of the other ones as well. They're very confining butterflies found on the hilltop, brilliant scarlet. People love to see them flying. Look at where you find them. Cranstiff Nature Reserve, around that waterfall there. When you walk along that trail, you see them sitting on the edge of the, of the forest canopy. This is Mandawe Hill, down in KZN, near Ishawi, which is a very famous and well-known butterflying spot. And I heard a piece of really good news tonight, because that was under threat from development. And it looks like uh, Ezembello KZN Wildlife have managed to get together with a local headman to get a tourism venture going there. So we can take people in there to appreciate the butterflies and birds 
that you find on the hilltop. And it's a very good spot for the Cedar Cray Boys to buy on Darway Cross. Then we have um, Montesil, um, near the Valley of a Thousand Hills. You can see him in the distance there. Whenever I put that photograph up, I wish I had the Yates of Africa music playing because it really is a beautiful place. You can see the blue haze there in the foreground, lovely catered in uh, sandstone sarpel grassland, and a great big fig tree in the background where you see fig tree blues if you like. And then the, the, the scarlet was also photographed at Mandawe Cross. Okay, on to some more, more bright colours. Because iridescent birds, we all know about, there's lots and lots of species of birds that have got bright iridescence on them. And start off with the amethyst sunbird, Tartimitra amethystina, which used to be the black sunbird, which it is a, basically a black bird. But I was very lucky, I managed to get at Hammersdale at work one day. I was able to catch a bird, a bird showing its beautiful amethyst. Uh, Truly iridescent, throat gorgeous, and beautiful little bird. And then I'm very lucky again in, in the garden of living in Gillets, we've got a gang of collared sunbirds, which are extremely aggressive and noisy. And they, if I go near their nests, they come down and challenge me, like this little male here. He's saying, What are you doing near my nest? That was taken with a macro lens. And they love lovely little things. So, iridescent butterflies. Well, first of all, the common diadem, Hyperlindus mysipus, is one of the most one of the best known iridescent butterflies you get in Africa. In fact, it's found all over Africa into the Far East, where they call it the um, they call it the monarch pulse, uh, the monarch diadem there. And it's even found in South America as well because it was introduced by, by human beings with their host clubs. And it's one of those butterflies whose iridescence is only visible when the when it's viewed from certain angles. That blue is, is what they call fugitive, it's not always visible. Then, of course, we've got the opals, and that particular there's two opals there. I put them up because they're probably the most iridescent butterflies you get in South Africa. The Natal opal, Natalensis, that's an orange butterfly, a coppery butterfly. And you can see that at certain angles, you've got this gold, and in fact, it, in some angles, it shines green, iridescent on top, on top of the copper. And then we've got Chrysoletus uranus, the, uh, the dark opal, which is found down in the, in the mountains of the Cape. And that one has got, again, that fugitive blue of a, of a glorious sort of iridescent silvery blue sheen. And it, the, the copper markings around the edge of the wing light up pink when you get, to get the sun in the right angle. And I also noticed somebody tonight said that the common mother of pearl is one of their favorite butterflies. I get lots of them in my garden. They've got the host plants all over the place. I fall off to Simbicato, often see the females laying eggs. And when they, when they fly around in their nuptial flights, they, they light up this beautiful uh, flashing purple, gold, and pale green iridescence as they fly around. They're, and they're quite large as well. The, the biggest specimens can be up to 100 millimeters across and really are a pleasure to see. So let's look at where you find them. That diadem was photographed on this hilltop above the Umphalozi River. And that's in the newly, the newly proclaimed um, um, Babanango Nature Reserve down there near the Umphalozi, which has got some great butterfly spots in it. The, the, the Natal Opal, if you look carefully at the bottom right, I just show my point there. That actually is, is one of the butterflies on its host plant. And that is Optius firmum bonifiloides. These butterflies live inside ants' nests as caterpillars. They, they shelter inside the nest and they come out at night to feed them the plant. And this one's quite easy to spot because the host plant is this uh, um, Optius firmum bonifiloides. But the, the, the mother of pearl, of course, feeds on a little uh, forest floor plant. Um, Many species of the of, of, of the Acanthaceae, it's used as a host plant. Uh, around our area, it feeds on one called Phalopsis imbricata, which I'm sorry to say it doesn't have a common name. And this particular place is Giba Gorge, near where I live. And if you walk along the edge of the forest at this time of the year, you often see them playing around in the canopy. Then, of course, uh, the, the, um, the, the dark opal uh, Uranus, standing in these beautiful, big, huge Cape Mountains like Mont Michel and also around, around the choice two paths. And further up toward towards north, and they they fly on those on those high um, hilltops. You can see the the rocky crag you can see here. You see this butterfly. You're going to walk up the ridge like this one, and as you climb up this ridge, they fly along, along these pinnacles. And it can be it can be quite fun photographing those butterflies because if you're not careful, if you wrong run step, and you uh, you can yeah fall a long way. But they're great fun. Let's look at some bright yellows now. We've got here the bright yellow birds, the black-headed oriole, Oriolus labiatus. Not the best bird for the but it's the only one we've managed to photograph. And that one uh, photographed in the garden in Gillets. And then of course weavers. A lot of them are brilliant yellow. This one here is is uh, is the uh, one of the one of the weavers, and you see can't see my own 
slide there now, but uh, that one is carrying a piece of nesting material that's photographed at the at the Manting Toti Bird Sanctuary, which is a great place to see birds. And if I got some some yellow butterflies, we got some glorious yellow butterflies here. At the bottom left, we've got the African angle grass yellow. There's two males there, they're getting ready to roost. But these butterflies tend to like finding yellow leaves or, or half dead leaves and hiding amongst them. It's almost as if they've got color vision and they know what. Uh, what, what 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 big camouflage looks like. So these two little chaps have found the same dead leaf to or semi-dead leaf to, to roost on. Then we have the autumn leaf vagrant, Aphrodite leader, other, otherwise known as the origin lemon butterfly, extremely brilliant color, lovely large butterflies, wingspan is around about 50 to 60 millimeters, very fast flying, not easy to photograph. You're gonna get up early in the morning when they're waking up to get a picture. Then we have the saffron sapphire. That's one of these butterflies that's a bit like the Narina trove. It's, a lot of people, it's their, it's their bogey butterfly. It's very difficult to find. And most people have actually found them by, rear, by finding the caterpillars on the host clubs and rearing them through. You can see the adults if you know where to go. Certain places around Heart of Sport Dam, where you've got these, these uh, river butt willows, which are yellow leaves in, in autumn, you find the butterflies hiding in those. And then, of course, the good old yellow pansy, which is extremely widespread all the way from from the savannah areas of, of, of Africa. And it's not only found in Africa, it's all the way across into, into Arabia and India and as, as far east as, as China and Japan. There's about seven or eight different subspecies across the far east. And they all look slightly different to our one here, but it's the same species. And then where do you find them? Well, that forest clearing is actually my garden again in Gillitz, and that's a great place for butterflies of all sorts. That is Arubi Gorge. And if you drive along that road through Oribe Gorge, beautiful forest, forest drive, and you can stop at a place like Subaru Park there, and you see these butterflies flying along. And if you're lucky, landing in, on, on the road verges, great place for birding and butterflying. This particular saffron sapphire was, was reared from an egg. Um, the, the yellow leaves are actually in the studio, and that's the bush belt, uh, one of the dams in Mpelosi. And we did a butterfly survey at the Sabka a few years ago, and we were very privileged to have our own private armed um, game guard with us. And we found, every time we found a Zymenia africana, the, the, uh, the host plant of the butterfly, which is the, the, the common sour plum, and I'd find butterfly eggs on there. And because I've got a lot of experience, I was able to tell the difference between the saffron sapphire eggs and, the, um, and other butterflies' eggs on the same plant. And I had a bird friend with me, Jenny Norman, she said, I'm not ticking that butterfly because I only took a butterfly, not an egg or a caterpillar. Uh, but she did eventually see the butterfly live in the wild. And there we have one of the, one of the beautiful uh, grassland uh, spots in KZN since the Nolangani Mountain near Kokstad. And you don't get that many yellow pansies down here in KZN. They don't, they don't often go into the lowland forests. It's really a grassland and forest and, and savanna butterfly. And that's one of the places we get them here. Now, obviously bright colors, royal purple, but royal purple birds, Royal purple butterflies. Here's a, one of a, another one of our, our local birds down in Erie, KZN, uh, found in the forests all the way along the coast, purple crested Turaco. I know it's not the best photograph of one. I saw uh, Richard Flack took a glorious picture of a, of a pair of these. I'd love to get a shot like that. You can see the lovely colors of the bird, very loud and noisy and, and really worth seeing. My personal favorite purple bird is the good old violet black starling, which we photographed this one down at Vernon Fox Nature Reserve. But we see them in plenty of places along the along the eastern side of South Africa. And that combination of, of this beautiful plum, iridescent plum color and white is, is, is spectacular. And we get butterflies with a similar kind of, of, pur of, of purple and white color um, combination. We have the Bushveld purple tip, Colotus ioni, which is found north of Durban. Uh, it starts to become numerous when you get around to Gela. And that, those, those are putting up in Zululand. And you can see there they've got male who's mating with the females. You've got, females have got orange tips to the wings and the males have got these purple tips. You can see that the tips of the wings are, are different colors depending on the angle of view. They go from plum to blue as a light change, change of um, direction. The, we've got several purple tips, the, the lilac tip, which is found in very, very, um, very arid places in, in, um, in uh, you get them in KZN and in Pelosi. But so the best places to see them are, are the, the dry mountains and the rain shadows of the wall and places like that. Then the green purple tip, again, another, another butterfly with a very iridescent uh, 
markings on the on the forwards. And then Kalejiti Rani, the coast purple tip, which is actually of all these butterflies, it's, it's unique. It's the only one of the purple tips that's only found in South Africa and nowhere else. And you get it roughly from Dweza Forest in, in, in the Eastern Cape and the furthest north you find it. Occasionally you see them on the Tagela, on the banks of the Tagela, but the best places to see them are actually around, around Durban, Cranstooth Nature Reserve and places like that. And, and they tend to fly along around, around uh, the, the, the ridges as well. So if you go to the hilltops and, at midday and watch, they'll come along like this one and sort of And then just some places where you see them, uh, Savannah, you know, Savannah Forest this particular one is at uh, is, is down in, in False Bay Park in, in you know, the of end. That's where you get this, these, these purple tips. I must apologize if you can hear a dog barking in the background. Our, our Labrador just loses it when she hears me talking and she will not be quiet. I'm hoping my wife can, can give us some, uh, some chocolate and shut her up. Um, so the lilac tip, where'd you find that? This one, you've got to get a bit adventurous. You've got to find the really arid places like this particular one's Tubix Port. And those are the mountains of the of the Oryxlad mountains, um, the Don I know one of my one of my friends in the audience has been up that mountain with me. And you also found it in, in, in the uh, in the drier part of the Lozi. And one of the subspecies is found in the real desert up, up in the Richter Svelte as well. The, the green purple tip, particularly fond of this plant, Polypolypolydora fastigiata. The butterflies love nectar. This particular one is a really good nectar plant. If you want to see butterflies in numbers, the best thing to do is go into the bush belt when these are flowering. You've got to time it just right there. They usually burst into flower about two or three weeks to a month after the, after the rains. And it doesn't have to rain. If somebody just puts water on the road, the, the plant will come up next to the road, even if anything else is dry and dead. You can see with a couple of African plain tigers there, but I've driven along the road between, between um, um, Mesaka Port and Vivo, and it looks like a snowstorm. You get the brown, somebody said brown vein white is their favorite butterfly. That's one of the ones you get there. And then that particular uh, uh, coast purple tip was further up along this trail in Cranston Nature Reserve, runs along one of the one of the one of one of the uh, ridge tops called the Ube Trail. And my friend Mark, who's watching, will know this place very well, one of our favorite birds. And that's where we tried to go that tip, coast purple tip. More bright colors. I'm not, I'm not going to go into what CMF means. Jenny Norman once told me. Um, so yeah, these these are the birds that everybody goes nuts at. I want to see, I want to see a, I want to see an African pitcher. I want to see a Narina Trogon. I've never seen an African pitcher in all my life. I have seen several Narina Trogons, but I've never managed to photograph one as well as Trevor, Trevor Hardacre did, who very kindly lent me these pictures. And yeah, there's beautiful green and red and multicolored birds, very easy on the eye, not that easy to find, and everybody wants to see one. And there are butterflies like this as well. Here's a couple of examples. The mottled green nymphs and the gold banded forester. These are these are both butterflies from the sand forests up in the northeast of South Africa, in places like Makuta Land, mainly. Uh, the mottled green nymph, funnily enough, turned up in 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 the Lekalamitsi Nature Reserve in Limpopo. And then you might think, why is this? this is a coastal forest butterfly? We think the region reason is that that forest is linked to the coast by the Olifant River, which has got forest all the way along. And we think coastal butterflies are fighting their way along those uh, forested river into the into the foothills of the Waldberg. I was amazed. Some, and somebody photographed it, put it on on iNaturalist, and said, "What's this?" And everybody was amazed. Gold banded forester. Everybody wants to see that butterfly. Uh, it can be very easy in, in Zululand. It can be very hard. Best time of the year to see them is from sort of February onwards, right through till May. You sometimes see them as late as June. But it's not a done deal. Sometimes you can go up there and, and almost completely dip. But it's the only way you're going to see them in South Africa. That butterfly is found all the way up north into, into Tanzania, Kenya, and across into Central Africa as well. Where do you find them? Well, actually, we find along that forest edge in Manguzi. This place, unfortunately, is, is really going through bad times at the moment. That was taken when the, when the path, when the fence still ran through the middle of the forest. And if you now go up there, there's nothing but um, but farmland where that forest is now. But you still get the butterfly there, funnily enough, because the forest is still there, just about it's hanging on. And that is the Euphrates and Nihon spot. That's the ranger's camp at Manguzi. Um, another story there is that I was running a butterfly tour with Colin Cohen, and one of the people wanted to see a, a gold-banded forester. 
And this fool said, oh, don't worry, they're common in Zululand, you'll be beating them off with wet rags. And so, of course, we went to Zululand and we just kept on dipping. I was getting really worried. That's the last place I went to was Manguzi. And luckily, Callum found some next to the rubbish bins at the Manguzi camp. So I heaved a great sigh of relief. Well, there's, the, there's some of our, our guests uh, frantically photographing these butterflies, which taught me a lesson. Never stick your chin out when you're leading a tour. Here's some LBJs. Okay, butterflies, LBJs. You get LBJs in birds as well, of course. Here's some classic examples, ones that I've been able to photograph, like the tour de flank pinia, which is very common around here in KZN. I always seem to get, those birds seek me out. Whenever I see a brown bird, it's always a tawny flank pinia. Then we have the rufous wings of cysticula, which I photographed at Sapi Stanga Hyde, which is obviously a great birding spot. You get good butterflies there as well. And then the African pipit, which was photographed at Cotswold Downs near, near Hillcrest. Um, I'll take a really good word, but it's an African pipit. I still battle with those. So let's look at some, Af some African butterfly LBJs. Well, there's actually a whole load of them here. I'm not going to go in. Oh, sorry. Yeah, going into any great detail here, but the Basita scully is a Lycenid butterfly. And that's actually quite an interesting one because the, the caterpillars are, 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 are not cannibals, they are cuckoos. They live inside ants' nests and the ants feed them on, we think, chewed up termites. We're not too sure exactly what it is, but it's a little brown butterfly job. The Vesita scholar is very common around the bushveld areas and the grassland areas. Once you get down into the Cape, there's about 30 or 40 different species of scully, all of which are closely related, and you, you need a real expert with you to tell them apart. Then the woodbush brown, which is found, uh, was only found at woodbush in, uh, in uh, down in Mpumalanga, or is it in Mpopo? And they can never remember. Uh, but that's one butterfly which is now, we think, has gone extinct because the, 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 the mark was to find them in. Uh, but uh, Hoposcorp has been drained. And this particular butterfly, or one like it, is found on, on, mount, on, on wet mountain tops all over the northeastern side of South Africa. That one was photographed, I think, at Harry Smith, but that one is uh, is not typical, and we think there's actually a species conference going on because uh, co um, complicated species relationships are common in butterflies, as they are in birds as well. That particular one there is uh, that's Hammersdale, so a new conservancy in Shanga Hill. That's a spot where you find the the, um, the scullies. That is again, that is um, Hammersdale, uh, not Hammersdale, sorry. Um, um, at the Taylor Mountain at Harrismith, Flatberg, and on top of that huge mountain, you get those uh, those marshes. We found this one of those on the Mark, Mark Mountain Brown. The little um, brown lycenid there. Um, the this one here is the um, one of the one of the lycenids, uh, Lepidochrysops um, um, ketsi, Luca macula. I didn't put his name on there. That's a very rare butterfly. It's actually red listed, and it's only found. At this spot here, which is in Tambuna Nature Reserve, and certain places down in the Trans Sky as well. There's a few spots you get from there. That particular was in Tambuna. The skipper you can see there, that brown one, is, is a is, is a, a long a long horn uh, silt. And then Pseudonympha, um, sorry, um, Savinia boys the Valley, the, the, the boys of Valley tree nymphs, a very common little LBJ you find down here in KZN. Forest elephants, yellow dodgers, and, uh, and, and African tree, tree rings. They, they on this on this slide you can see they all look different to one another, but every one of them has got relatives that are almost identical, and you need a bit of experience to tell them apart. So there's the spot for the for the tree ring, and that's again the Infolosi River, and those other ones are all found in that garden in case of again. Rewilded suburban garden, six meters up, six hundred meters up from Durban, as well as little brown jobs for butterflies. You get little blue jobs as well. And they're probably even more numerous than the, than the, the little brown jobs. And there's, a, there's a whole sort of smorgasbord of them here. Now, running around from, from the left to the right, we've got a little gray smoky blue. That's, got a, that's actually got a gray upper side. It's not really a blue at all. And then the tiny grass blue, which is one of the smallest butterflies you find in Africa. And that's an easy butterfly to identify because when it lands, it waggles its wings backwards and forwards. The whole body moves side to side. So it's actually, on a still photograph, it's hard to show, but it's one of those butterflies that, by watching its behavior, can identify it. The African grass blues, Azeria nizma, most people who've got lawns will know that butterfly because it will turn up whatever. Uh, the caterpillars feed on that little yellow creeping wood soil, which grows in just everybody's lawn. 
There's another giant cupid, tradition giant cupid, glorious blue upper side. There are many species of blue giant cupid around Africa, in fact, all the way up into, into, into Arabia, as far north as um, Spain and, um, and, uh, and Israel, you get these blue butterflies, all very similar to one another. Then we have the, the African clover blues, so you do the Antonopta, very similar to the African grass blue. And the only really way to tell them apart is this row of spots on the high wing on the side. You see it follows a, a regular pattern here. And the, the, the size and weight of those spots varies from specimen to specimen, by the way. The African grass blues are very big black spots like this one. And you can see this one, the, the row is slightly dented inwards. That's the way to tell them apart. The bush bronze, very common all over the place in East Africa. And then the grizzled cupid, Orochrysus subravus. The Orochrysus genus, the cupids are, are generally specialist grassland butterflies. There are a couple that have moved into fame bus, which are extremely rare. And in fact, one of them we think has now gone extinct. So they're special butterflies. And then, of course, the common zebra blue, which is found just about everywhere in Africa. It's even turned up in the UK now. The caterpillars feed on, on, on the plumbago, leadwort, which is found all over Africa. They also feed on various vetches and teprosias and many different uh, legumes as well. And a couple of bird friends of mine said, oh, we can tell them apart because they look different. There are four species of zebra blue. This particular one we think is Pyrethos. If you look in the book and on the app, you'll see the four different species. The only way to tell them apart is to actually chop the, the abdomen open, take out the, the uh, genitalia and look at them under a microscope. You can do the male with a purse paid in the tweezers and a, and a hand lens, and it's not very, not very kind on the butterfly. And those are all the same species, even though the undersides look different, all the same species. So they're found all over, all over the eastern and central areas. And of course, the range, the rare paint of specialists, Naomi and Brinkmanai, are, are, you know, those are the ones that, that are harder to find. Skulkers, like you get skulking birds, like the, the um, southern bobo, which I've heard of Peter Webb's garden again. And then, of course, the somber green bull, which is on Giba Gorge, the only time I've ever managed to get a picture of that bird. And having an R7 with me, I was able to sort of lift the camera up and bash up a photograph really quickly, and I got that shot. And, uh, yeah, I've never seen one before or since. It's the only one I've ever seen. So let's look, have a look at some skulking butterflies. There are actually many of them, and not all of them are, are gold brown things. Like, like the, the bobo you get, or boo-boo, you do get brightly colored skulkers. Of course, the... The one skulker, Eastern Yellow Banded Evening Brown, Galopides diversa, that's found along rivers uh, down in southern Cape Verde and, and northern Eastern Cape. Uh, one place for them is, is a river in, in uh, down at Port Edward. And that's an interesting butterfly because that particular species is found in South Africa. Its closest relatives are found up in Mozambique. And you walk along that river um, bank through the forest, and these things sit on the floor, and you can't see them if they fly in the evening. The only way to photograph them was with flash, and they're very hard to spot. Then you have the Zulu shade fly. We've got three species of shade fly. They're unique to South Africa. That particular one is found in Zululand. And then, yeah, beautiful golden underside with orange bands, very conspicuous looking, but because they fly in the deep shade, very hard to see. Then we got the, the shade swallowtail, very well named. Unlike other swallowtails, and somebody tonight said they, they like swallowtails. This is one of the this one and the, the bush kite are the two hardest swallowtails to see because they don't fly out in the open feeding on nectar like citrus swallowtails do. They tend to skulk around in the shade or the, the bush kite flies in the canopy. This one's this one's feed on bride's bush down in the shade of down at the Bella uh, Peninsula. Gaudy commodores, they like to they like to live in, in, in shady spots by riverbeds, uh, particularly in the Drakensberg. If you go, go walking next to a stream in winter and you disturb the grass, you can get dozens of those things flying out, and they, they look black when they fly. A couple of rarities, the Zulu yellow buff and the southern white mimic, those are lichen feeders, a couple of feed on lichen, and they're found usually in, in the sand forests of, of northern KZN, although, believe it or not, we actually found a colony of the, what, the southern white mimic um, at uh, Mandawe Hill, which was unheard of. It's not supposed to be found in, in sort of semi-savannah like that. Then a tall yellow banded sapphire, very brightly colored, blue and black upper side. The caterpillars feed on various kinds of, of mistletoe, Loranthus. And you might think, oh, that's one of those brightly colored butterflies that fly around hilltops. Well, they don't, as a rule, fly around hilltops. You've got to walk through the forest path and find them feeding on flowers. And that particular one is, I cheated, I reared it from caterpillars, which is not that difficult to do if you know the house plant. And then, of course, you've got the bush beauty, the lowland bush beauty. 
That's Peralipi dendrophila syndosa. That particular one was photographed in my garden, but you find them in all the, um, the, the Afro-temperate and Afro-montane mist belt forests, all the way from, I suppose, as far south as Dresda, and the furthest north you find them in the, are the, um, the Sopansberg and the mountain forests around uh, um, the Sopansberg, uh, sorry, the um, uh, Waldberg and the Transvaal Drakensberg. And the interesting thing about this butterfly is we know but its, it's the closest relatives are not found over the rest of Africa. They're found in India and in South America. And that, that butterfly has got Gondwanan roots. From DNA work, we know that that butterfly, or its, its common ancestor with the table mountain beauty, is very closely related to it. And the leafy butterflies from, from, from India and South America are all related by DNA. And they've been around for around about 90 to 100 million years, or they're their, um, their common ancestor was. So these are really ancient creatures. They actually they actually predate the birds. They were they were around uh, before the the KT uh, the Cretaceous uh, uh, tertiary event, the, the meteorite that uh, that changed everything 65 million years ago. Butterflies were around. Nymphalid butterflies were around. In fact, the current the current butterfly families as we know them were actually around back then. So these are really ancient creatures. Some examples of where you find them there, Mandawe Hill again, shade of the trees, you find those butterflies there. That is the, the deep shade at Antamvuna along that really sort of primitive looking forest trail uh, where you find them sitting on the path. Interesting thing about those butterflies is that they can actually hear. They've got an ear at the base of their four-wing cubital vein. And so when you, you can creep along as, as, as quietly as you like. If you step on a twig, they take up and fly away. That gaudy commodore was photographed here in Giba Gorge. You've got these holes in the cliff where they're, they're overwinter in the cold weather. This was photographed in the Nibella Peninsula in the understory there, which I think some people know that area quite well. And, and this was this is Harold Johnson Nature Reserve. And those bushes there, you can see along the edge of this grassy area, which is typical of what you get in the what they call the Indian Ocean coastal belts, uh, sort of forest grassland mosaics. The host plant, which is a, a, mistle, a mistletoe, grows in these trees, and it's actually a lot easier to find the, find the larvae and rear than prove it is to cat, uh, catch the adults on film. That's the forest edge of Harold Duncan, and that's that, that garden in Gillix again, in the shady area. Mockers, you get mocking birds, and you get mocking butterflies as well. One of the best known mockers in, in, in our area is the good old red cap robin chat, the, the old Natal robin. I've got one that lives in my garden, it keeps trying to con me into thinking it's a crowned eagle. Somebody needs to tell it that crowned eagles are not, do not call them on the bottom of the bush. Uh, that was photographed at Berman Bush. They're very difficult birds to people on. And then, of course, the other one is the pork tail drongo, Daucurus ad similis. That bird in my garden, again, it, I don't know, half the time I don't know what birds are in my garden because they always turn out to be, to be robins or, or drongos. And the other thing about drongos is they, they love to eat butterflies. And this particular specimen likes to lurk next to my butterfly trap and catch the caraxes and they fly in. So here's some mockers amongst the butterflies. Got some, you'll notice here there's quite a few similar looking creatures, aren't there? There's a female mocker swallowtail. The male is a big sort of creamy white butterfly with long tails. The females have got several different forms. There's one, Caponius, the one which mimics the African plain tiger, black and white wingtips, orange main color. Then you've got the Pithacornides, which mimics the Southern Friar. The Southern Friar butterfly carries toxins in its body. The swallowtails don't. The African plain tiger also carries toxins in its body. The white wild telkinia and the, the Acara acrea also feed on plants and are full of irritants. This butterfly, Boys of Old Spots acrea, doesn't feed on toxic plants, but it looks awfully like this Acara acrea, apart from the fact that it's nearly three times the size. And we think that's because with birds, we know that the size is everything, and the larger the uh, the colored object, the more likely they are to take notice of it. So this one's saying uh, I'm nutty tasting and I'm a lot bigger than the average acrea, so you really don't want to try and eat me. And this butterfly here, the forest queen, Caraxes Wakefieldy, is, is a butterfly which is not toxic, doesn't feed on toxic plants, but it looks awfully like a mock swallowtail, it looks awfully like a southern fry. Now, just looking where you see them, those top two butterflies, there's some grasslands, again, near Hammersdale, where you find these butterflies, a lot of uh, alien plants around, but we do get good butterflies there. The mocker swallowtail, that was photographed in the Shongwaini Valley, not far from here. The friar, 
and the female mocker swallow sail, they were both photographed. That's Le Calamiti Forest near, in Limpopo. And that urge anybody to go there. If you want to go looking for birds and butterflies, that is one of the places to go. You see the most amazing creatures there. Not, and it's also full of good mammals as well. And it ranges from riverine forests at the bottom all the way to Afro-temperate forests at the top and also high altitude grassland. It's really worth a visit. Together mouth is where you find those two butterflies along those, those uh, woodland areas. And then the corrections where Fieldy, a seal of forest, which you can see, if you look at the picture of the Tagela here, that those dunes at the bottom, that's where seal of the forest is. So you get these butterflies along this river, river frontage and on the hilltop as well. Parasites, and we all know there's bird parasites around. I mean, cuckoos, like the class is cuckoo, and that, that gardening gillix again. Uh, it's a male, we get the females as well, and they love to feed on the acrea caterpillars. It's feeding, I love, they love to sit in my, in my, in my undoni tree. Then the scaly fretted honey guide, indicator very gardens. That was photographed at Kubuni Nature Reserve River Riverine Bush. In this place here, where you can, that's one place where you can sit and listen to African warbles as the sun goes down. If you're lucky, you might see one. And then, of course, the emerald cuckoo, which of course everybody wants to see. I'd never seen one until this one popped out of the bush at, uh, at, at Marion, but I was walking through this thick bush here, walked around the corner, and there it was out in the open. So there's some parasitic birds, beautiful things. Now let's have a look at some parasitic butterflies. And it's not as obvious as you think. Here's a scully. This is a Buddhist Basuta scully, Festa Basuta Basuta. And here, I didn't take this photograph. This has been very seldom observed. That's a, that's a larva of a peninsula scully. It hasn't been, hasn't been filled with the uh, Basuta scully. We think it does something similar. These ants, which is the, the uh, pugnacious ants, Anaplupus custodians, you see this ant is actually feeding the caterpillar mouth to mouth, probably on chewed up termite. And there's a, another picture of a Basuta scully there that's a male. These butterflies, as adults, lack mouth parts. They can't feed on nectar. They carry, they, they get all their energy from what the ants feed them as babies. And they, they can fly fast and for quite a long time. But once they run out of they run out of, uh, of fuel, then any bird come, any passing bird will come along and eat them. Then we have the southern pied willy legs. And willy legs are extremely common butterflies. You get them all over Africa. And generally, wherever you see these ants and scale insects, the scale insects give up honeydew. You can see the little scale insect nymphs here. There's a slightly bigger scale insect there. And the ants come along and they milk these for honeydew because the, 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 the plant suckers suck sap from the plant and they exude honeydew, which the butterfly then comes along and sucks. And it's got this little woolly legs here, very well named. And with those woolly legs, it seems to massage the, um, the, the, the plant uppers. Now, this is a piece of absolute luck because we know that the caterpillars are carnivorous. They, they feed actually on these plant hoppers. But I was in my friend's son Bradley's garden photographing these, and I was spreading it with a caterpillar. And up, up runs an ant and feeds it mouth to mouth. And I managed to get it on, on, on silicon. And that's the first time that's ever been photographed. That, that was new to science. And I was so pleased to see that. Just going through there, this is, this is Festa Yulbizai, an adult that's taken it um, down in Cape Town at Silver Mine, where there's a colony of them. That's the spot where you get them. This is a place uh, near Inanda Dam, down in, uh, down in Durban, where you get the uh, Inanda, Inanda Mountain. There are colonies of, of, of scotties everywhere along here. This is Montesil. They're quite numerous around our area. And you always find them where you've got um, big, big termite mounds. The southern pile of bully legs. This is one particular spot where I found a big colony of them. This is the Umpapuri Cycad Reserve in South Pensburg. If we look here, now we have two black birds of attitude. In the garden, we get these seven black flycatchers, which are, uh, I thought flycatchers were, were sort of soft little sweet things, which uh, we fly around catching the odd butterfly, but generally are not that aggressive. Not these chaps, they hang around in the bunch and make a lot of noise. And then the other one that we get, this particular one was fairly good, uh, Pigeon Valley Nature Reserve, was a drongo, square tailed drongo. I got close to this bird's nest. It would not let me walk past. That was putting up with a macro lens. If I went any closer than about a meter from that bird, he flew up with his gape over and trying to peck me. And it's very, very strong butterfly, a bird with a lot of, a lot of holding. So let's have a look at a couple of butterflies with similar behavior. Well, the Caraxes are, are well known for being, for being fast flying canopy butterflies. 
very pugnacious. If you ever get close to one of these, and if you feel the, the leading edge of the forewing, it's serrated like a buzz saw. And these butterflies often feed on, on tree sap leaking from, from holes in the in, 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 um, in tree trunks. And they actually rustle and, 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 and chase one enough the, the food source using their forewings. And they, 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 they sit on treetops like this, and they take off and they fly at high speed around the hilltop, chasing other ones around. That was photographed, that's, that particular photograph is Fort Pearson to get a mouth. You get those satire caraxes sitting on this bush here. And that was, uh, was photographed at Lindani Hilltop in the Waterberg. It was dry um, um, bush belt, central bush belt hilltops in the, uh, in the Waterberg are very good butterfly spots. You get a lot of caraxes and, and other hilltopping butterflies there. Then high flyers. Well, showing off a little bit here, um, one of those people who's got the uh, crown, crowned eagle, that was photographed at Crest Home Nature Reserve just down the road, but I've actually seen them flying over my garden as well. So that's my that's my apex predator. They prey on monkeys in my garden. I've seen them do it. And then, of course, a little bit further away, in Shlui, we've got this beautiful tawny eagle, Akila Rapax. We photographed, we photographed him on a, on a butterfly trip uh, when we were doing butterfly counting in, in in the Ushishuri Nature Reserve. Look at a couple of butterfly equivalents. Well, there's quite a few. Hilltops, if you go with any butterfly guy, will tell you, go on a hilltop, that's where you get the good butterflies. These are all photographed either on hilltops or in the canopy of a forest. Bicolored skipper, that particular one was photographed in Cranslip Nature Reserve. My friend Mark, who's watching, will know this one well because uh, I grabbed that one uh, one day when we were up there together. Uh, we'd come right down to within macro lens range. Beautiful yellow and black on top and this golden yellow underneath. Hutchinson's high fly, that was spouting after Mandawe. I think Mark got that as a life for a couple of weekends ago at the same spot. And that's one of the that's one of Africa's most glorious butterflies. It's not very big. The wingspan's only about 60 millimeters across. Sorry, not 60 millimeters, about, about, about uh, 35 to 40 millimeters across. And these markings on the underside are brilliant silver. That was photographed at, uh, in the in the Macharisberg Mountains, and that's uh, Jenny Norman and Fran de Ocher, who's unfortunately no longer with us, um, photographing, I think it was Jenny's first Hutchinson's high fly. The, uh, the, the, the uh, southern um, uh, white bark Caraxes, Brutus natalensis, very common butterfly all over Eastern Africa. It's now made its way as far south as the Cape. The bush kite swallowtail, Papilio euphronor, that's unique among South African swallowtails. It's the only species that is endemic to South Africa. It's not found anywhere else. And unlike the other species, the larvae don't feed on citrus or rutaceae. They feed on, on, on the laurel family. And interestingly enough, everywhere you go in Africa, there's at least one laurel feeding swallowtail. All the other ones will use citrus. The foxy caraxes, any hilltop you go to in, in, in the savannah, you'll get those butterflies, usually sitting on a very prominent plant like this euphorbia. The Natal silver line, Again, anywhere you go, not just on big hilltops, but even a, a prominent bush in your garden will attract, attract them. They'll come along and, and sit very aggressively perched on the, on the edge of a tree, waiting for anything to come past. And then, of course, here's the forest queen. There's a male forest queen. And that particular, these chaps in the forest in Cater then, they often see them sitting on the edge of the canopy like this. And although it's a, a male butterfly, it's still called the forest queen. And its nickname is actually Freddie, after Freddie Mercury. So let's have a look at where you find them. Uh, that particular uh, bicolor was photographed in Kranzluf, but Ngoi Top uh, is a very good place to see them. Unfortunately, that particular place is very hard to get to. It's one of the few places in Southern Africa I know where you can do a 360 and you can see no sign of human habitation in all directions. It's like being in the Central African jungles, it's amazing. That's uh, Kai Swallowtail was photographed on Nectar on this Calpurnia aurea down in Ungeli Forest near, near Kokstad. Um, that's the one place you can go and be reasonably sure of seeing them fairly low down, You're right up and just to stretch your neck and get some tonsils trying to photograph them in the canopy. That Caraxes is photographed on, the, on, on these, these uh, palm trees where he was, uh, he was doing his uh, territorial flying as a kind of stain bank. This is Manguzi Forest where we got a picture of the, uh, of the, of the forest queen. And this is Munich, near um, near the Buffels Buffelsberg, a frighteningly dry and desiccated looking place. But even when it gets in this like that, you still get the butterflies. You don't have to be fresh and green to see butterflies. And then, of course, that uh, silver line was photographed at Mandawe, like so many other hilltopping butterflies. 
owls. They get owls. We get the uh, the birds like the giant eagle owl or the uh, spotted eagle owl, with Pigeon Valley, uh, giving us this look, saying, "How dare you! How dare you disturb my midday sleep?" And more moths and butterflies. There aren't many butterflies that look like owls, but we get the cream striped owl, the faint owl, the Walker's owl, and the speckled emperor. And these, this is what you call dazzle coloration. This moth sits of its wings folded over the hind wings. When you disturb it, it flicks its wings open, and you see these lurid eyes. And if you're a small predator looking for a meal, if that happens, what are you going to do? You're going to run away. This particular one likes to live in underneath rocks, and in a uh, particular good place for them is the, is the ablution blocks at Harold, uh, Harold Steinbank. And these butterflies, or moths rather, are, are, are viewed with a lot of superstition and fear. And in fact, in, in Madagascar, it's called uh, Intatapadi, which is meaning the deaf, the deaf butterfly. Satara, Krug National Park, where you get the cream striped owls. If you spill your beer on the floor, they turn up. That one was photographed near, near Mandawe, Babani Lake. Uh, that particular one was uh, was photographed at, uh, at the uh, at um, Powell Stain Bank, but you get them along these riverine banks at uh, Inlanda Wilds. And this one was photographed in this is Wakefield um, Nature Reserve in the Midlands. And there's lots of wattle plantations around there. And that moth, the caterpillars actually feed on wattle. It feeds on a it does feed on 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 the indigenous vicarias, but they seem to prefer wattle. They're extremely common in the uh, in, 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 the, in the east of Natal. Just moving on, on quickly, here we got the uh, widows. Again, thank you to Trevor because he's a one bird I never managed to photograph. We got the red collared widow bird, fan tailed, and long tailed widow birds. And widows, of course, in butterflies are these browns, as Syrene. And some of, the, some of the most spectacular and rare butterflies you get are in this group. Uh, the Midlands widow is only found on certain hilltops in, in the Midlands. And there are about seven different species of, of Dingana found around Southern Africa, and they're all rare. Uh, then, the, then you've got the Pondo Land Autumn Widow, Oxalis, which is quite a big butterfly. It's about 60, 70 millimeters across. Drakensberg Bronze Speckled Widow, found in the Drakensberg. They all, the caterpillars of these all feed on, on these wiry forest grasses. And the, the Veined Widow in Lesotho, which is really a, a butterfly of the, of the Karoo. And, uh, they feed on those dry grasses you get in, in, the, in the grassland areas of Karoo. That particular widow was found at Fisherman's Bend at Cockpad. Again, uh, the host plant grows along the road you, you can see there. There it is. It's, it's, I'm told it's now called Tinaxia. It used to be called Merck's Munoa. Spitzkop again is where you find those, um, those, those Midlands widows. And interestingly enough, the caterpillars feed on a grass that grows within those rocks. It's, it's, it, it's sheltered from fire and by grazing. This is below Sony Pass in the Drakensberg. You go up there around about October, November time, you can see thousands of widows flying along the road there. And then that butterfly was only found along the 2,800 meter contour above Sony Pass. And that's one of our butterfly guys singing the sound of music. That's a young young. And on the opposite side of that valley, there was a, there was a bearded vulture nest. So there's another parallel. You've got uh, high flying birds, high flying butterflies. Migrants, also, thank you to Trevor, because I never managed to fed a swallow ever. Maybe now I've got an R7, I'll manage it. Barn swallow, Arunda rustica, and the Amua falcon. Now, the interesting thing about these birds is that they migrate huge distances all the way from Southern Africa to Europe in the swallows case, and the Amua falcon goes as far as, as Siberia. Here are some migrating butterflies and moths. So I only mentioned the brown veined white earlier on. He's changed his name now to the pioneer caper white. The African migrant, Catapsilia florella, these are what they call burst migrants. They, they, something triggers them to have a huge population explosion in a certain part of the country, and they just fly in all directions from a central spot. And the, the, the pioneer caper white comes from the Kalahari, but we can down here in KZN feeding on, on blue haze. And, but they don't fly all the way like the American monarch does from one end of the continent to another. They tend to fly a few hundred kilo, uh, kilometers and then get eaten hit by a car or, or, or mate and find a host plant. They're not real long distance there and back migrants, but these are the convolvulus hawk moth. Nobody's done any work on that one yet, but we do know that these are the size of small birds. They're about the same body weight as, a, as one of the smaller warblers, and they go all the way from South Africa, we think, to Europe, to Northern Europe in one go. And I've been in places where you get countless millions of these 
settling in, settling down for the night uh, during the migrations. Then the painted lady, little painted lady butterfly, which we now know to be a more a more um, widespread migrant than the American monarch. It goes all the way from Central Africa to Northern Europe in one hit, six, a 9,000 mile round trip that is high as 6,000 meters above sea level. And it's been measured with, with, there's a lot of scientific evidence now that they actually fly over the Sahara and the Mediterranean in one go. So there's Maritz Kopf. We've once trapped a whole number, of, a huge mountain that sticks 2,000 meters up into the clouds and those moths, we had it run a mock chop on top of there, and we found them swarming on there. Uh, that was a place where we were finding the African monarchs, Golden, Golden Valley in Macalisburg. The painted lady loves this particular mass flowering plant, Dicephalus angulifolius. We found them in big numbers, tanking up on nectar to fly north. And then again, there's the, there's the blue hedge flower, very popular with the, with, with the pioneer cable white. And then, of course, we come to twitching towards the end. And I've only ever twitched one bird in my life. Uh, that was when we went down to Nziki Private Nature Reserve. We were butterflying at, um, uh, at, at the um, Kubiini Reserve when word got around that Malagasy Pond Heron had turned up at uh, Nziki and I had a couple of birds with me who just had ants in their pants and just kept on nagging, nagging, nagging. So can we go and twitch the heron? So we did, and we, and we found it as well. There it is. So that was successful. And we actually got a photograph of the bird. And here's a couple of Twitch's butterflies' favorites. Uh, the white spotted sapphire, which is only found in South Africa around the edges of, of False Bay Park, of, of uh, False Bay. Uh, it's found up into Mozambique as well, but it's wherever we find it, it's rare. And then, of course, the water, Waterberg Acrea copper, Ericsonia edgy. That's one of those species which we thought for 25 years we thought it was extinct. It had disappeared from its original locality in the Waterberg, hadn't been seen for years. Lepsock put out a reward, and our ex-president, Mark Williams, actually won the reward. He actually discovered a colony near, near, near Bella Bella, Warmbass as was. Uh, but unfortunately, it hadn't been seen there for a few years either. It's an extremely rare butterfly. Those unprepossessing looking cliffs on the, on the left there is where you find the mistletoes that the white spotted sapphires caterpillars used. And then the Waterberg Acre Copper, that field at uh, Batalia Nature Reserve, is the only place we know that butterfly to fly. And I know the Lepsock guys go there every year looking for it. It's a treacherous special of note. The weekend after we heard about that butterfly being found, Jenny Norman and I were on a plane to Joburg Airport to go and twitch it. Okay, so there we go. We come to the end. Um, and thanks for watching. There's a couple of links there, which I know uh, um, Andrew will make available. Um, Africa, Lepsock Africa, my own email address, and also the, uh, the butterfly app. So, Coming to an end, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, hand you back to Andrew for any questions and also to go through the, the webinar chat because I haven't seen those um, um, names running running past, but I, I know that a heck of a oh, there's Rick Nuttall. So, Andrew, do you want to be the compare for the question, the question and answer session? Yeah, well, before we do, Steve, just a massive thanks from myself and on behalf of everyone. Um, it's such a privilege to have someone with your expertise and knowledge on something that uh, I know Bird is also passionate about everything winged and everything natural and beautiful and wonderful. So um, I think there'll be a lot of people on their next birding trip looking down just as much as they look up onto the floor to see what butterflies they're flushing as well as spending some time on some hilltops, not just to find some birds, but also to see what butterflies they can find congregating in the area. So uh, yeah, do, do go and um, find Steve's uh, book as well as his app. Um, it's available on the, the Apple and Android uh, app stores. Um, and that book is published by Straight Nature if that helps you to find it, but it's the butterflies of South Africa. Um, Steve, there's a question that's been asked by a couple of people. So I'm gonna ask that one first. Uh, Tom and Margie, as well as uh, Ted van der asked, and I'm sure this is something that you have a textbook answer to. Um, what is the difference between a moth and a butterfly? Ah, my favorite one. Yeah, the, the quick and flippant answer is there really isn't a difference. They're, they're all Lepidoptera, and they, they, they come from a, an order called Lepidoptera. And like, of course, you've got birds which are aves, um, insects are insecta. Within the birds, you've got orders like the, um, you've got the ducks, which is the, well, you've got passeriforms and you've got anseriforms and so on. With uh, with, with uh, butterflies, you've got superfamilies within that one order of insects, Lepidoptera. 
There are between 45 and 47 superfamilies, depending on who you listen to. Only one of those superfamilies are the classical butterflies, the day flying, not always day flying, not always brightly colored. There's no real hard and fast rule to tell the difference. You've got to, if you really want to get into it, you've got to know the various superfamilies, like the emperor moths, for instance, so big fluffy things with feathery antennae, uh, hawk moth, which are, which are real speed models, like we saw the convolvulus hawk moth earlier on. You get to the point where you can identify a particular moth by its shape and its coloring. And the same thing goes with butterflies as well. So it, it's, it's, there's no hard and fast answer, unfortunately, because people will tell you, oh, butterflies have got club shaped antennae and moths don't. Well, there are plenty of moths with club antennae and there are pl plenty of butterflies with thin filamentous antennae. Having said that, if it's got feathery antennae, it's not a butterfly. And if it sits with his wings folded over his back like a roof, then it's not a butterfly. Those are certain hard and fast, fast rules you can go. It's about the only ones that can offer you, unfortunately. All right, thank you. Fascinating. Um, someone had uh, a question here, Penny Abbott, and she says she's been bedazzled by all of your photographs. Um, but, but where does one start if you want to get into butterflying? Well, if you've got if you got a garden with some flowers, you can start in your garden. Um, that's where that's where I started out. Was this is simply um, in fact, within Lepsoft, there's a wonderful uh, initiative called the Caterpillar Rearing Group, run by Herman Stoudy and a lady called Sanjana Bradley. And all they do is they find caterpillars because we don't know the life history of, I think at one point we only knew the life history of 5% of, of our Lepidoptera. I think that's gone up to about 30% now, thanks to these ladies. They find a caterpillar, they rear it through. They don't breed silkworms anymore. Now it's wild found caterpillars. And in your garden, in your local park, find a caterpillar, give it something to eat is what you normally found it on and see what it turns into. So if you're going to go, if you're going to go butterflying, particularly to go and see the spectacular ones, then, you know, join Lepsock. There's a lot people all over the country. Um, you know, Kellen and I are starting to run butterfly tours as well, where we take people to the, to the better known spots where you can see the, you know, the rarities and start and do that more and more in retirements. Um, but you don't, you know, you don't have to go into the, you know, Amazon jungle to see nice butterflies. You can, you can see good ones in your, in your, in your own garden. That's exactly uh, the answer I like to give when people ask, how do I get into birding? Start in your garden. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're amazed at what you can find. I think the same applies here, it seems. Um, a couple of questions in the, in the question um, and answer box about migration in butterflies. So Anna Lee uh, Barker has asked, uh, the kaleidoscope of brown bed white butterflies filling the summer skies of Johannesburg uh, is their flight from the Kalahari to Mozambique the unique phenomenon to butterflies or the other species who have this behavior elsewhere in our country? And then there was a second question before you answer um, from Eleanor Mary along similar lines. Do we have migratory butterflies flying great distances or do they simply migrate altitudinally according to the seasons? I don't know about, I know a lot of birds do altitudinal migration. I'm not sure about butterflies, but the brown veined white is, is not unique. I mean, there, there are other butterflies like the African migrant, for instance, which, which they, it's always, we don't really know what triggers that migration. In fact, there's a, there's a chap called uh, René Savlant, who's doing his PhD on that butterfly right now. Up at Swat. He's working with uh, Mr. and Mrs. Oppenheimer and their people in Duncan McFadgen up at Swalu to try and figure out what triggers this, this, this burst. Because we used to think, oh, well, it's because, you know, the, its host plant is the, is the uh, shepherd's tree, um, Bosque albitrunca, which is often the only green thing in the Kalahari. It's, it's got this enormously long taproot, which can go all the way down to bedrock, and everything else is dead and dry, but that plant is still green. So the caterpillars, the butterfly lays its eggs on the, or lays, lays her eggs on the plant, the eggs hatch out. Eventually, you get to the point where the tree gets, de gets defoliated by the larvae, and then we kind of posited, well, is it that the butterflies and the caterpillars know when the next generation is going to defoliate the plants and there'll be nothing left for us to eat and we'll die out? And it seems as though there's some sort of a safety valve happening where they get to a point where they suddenly start flying in all directions. And, and the um, Bellinosa rota is not just found in South Africa, it's found all the way up into all of Africa. There's a migration happening in Nigeria right now, I know. Uh, it's found in Arabia, it's found in all over the, the Middle East, uh, as far as far east as, as the Himalayas, it's found on, on Madagascar. How far they get? Probably, we know that they're seen flying out in the Mozambique Channel, so they, they do get out to sea, and you probably find that they do get blown as far as, 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 as Madagascar, because other butterflies have, have been in the past. 
the, the, the butterflies, which are true sort of A to B migrants, and the moth, you got that moth, the, um, um, there's a dragonfly called Pantala uh, flavescens, which we know goes all the way from South Africa to Siberia in one hit, and it's used as, as food by Amur falcons all the way, because we know this because people have, uh, have uh, done post-mortems on, on, on hunters kill Amur falcons and they find the dead dragonflies in their bodies, in their stomachs. And the same thing goes with the painted lady. I said earlier on, that butterfly we know uh, travels enormous distances. And there's a, there's a sort of a circular migration that goes around and over the, the uh, Vasara Desert and the Mediterranean from, from the Sahel right up into, into Europe. And we know the same thing happens in the south as well, but we don't know as much about it. There's a, there's a guy called Gerard Salavera who did his PhD, and he's now a prof at one of the universities up there. And, uh, and in fact, I was with Callan on a butterfly tour, and we found painted ladies near Munich. We found flying together beautiful, freshly emerged specimens and really real tatty ones that had obviously flown a long distance. And Gerard said, Steve, why didn't you catch me a specimen? And so it was a bit difficult when you're on a butterfly trip to hold out the net and start killing the things, you know. Um, but I said, next time I see it, if I do, I will. Because he said, you know, they can tell uh, using chemistry what part of the, of the trophic pyramid that butterfly comes from. They can tell if it comes from the southern hemisphere or the northern hemisphere because of the host plants. So there's still a lot that we don't know about these things. And we don't know how they get from Cape Town. I mean, Cullen had them swarming in his garden in, 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 um, in what do you call it, um, um, uh, Scarborough down in the Cape, going north. I've seen them when we did our tour last Easter. We had, we had thousands of them, not in vast clouds like the, like the brown vein white, because they they are they fly, they fly in sparse numbers. You know, you'll see two here, two there. But after you've driven 150, 600 kilometers, you realize you've seen thousands. Of them. And they're all going in the same direction. Where they end up? Central Africa. What they do know is that when they are breeding up in the Sahel, we don't know what they do in, in, in places like Zambia. It must be something similar. Their numbers get so big that you can't drive a four by four over the, over, over the ground because there's just so many caterpillars and crystals, you just skip. And also the place is crawling with little brown birds like lesser white throats and other uh, small warblers and insectivorous birds. And what they do know is that these birds follow the butterfly migrations and the moth migrations up and down. And the reason why you get this seasonal migration of birds is because they're following the insect uh, food source. And I'm pretty sure that the reason why you get the odd lesser white throat in the southern hemisphere instead of the northern hemisphere, it just followed the wrong bunch of painted ladies and got confused. We don't know for sure, but it's a very plausible story. <laughs> um, incredible ecology that we're still uncovering. About. Absolutely. The world's one big ecosystem and we're still learning about it. It's fantastic. There's, a, there's another question from Eleanor Ill Mary. Um, in one of the species, you showed us the female was more brightly colored than the male. Is this a common trend in butterflies as opposed to birds where the males usually more colorful? Yeah, in fact, um, you know, with butterflies, it's often the case that the males are more brightly colored. Like the sapphires, for instance, the males tend to be a, a brighter blue than the females are more white on them. But certainly in the Caraxes and, and some, of the, some of the browns and some of the swallowtails as well, the male can be sort of a black and white butterfly, whereas the female is you know, a multicolored one, especially the ones that mimic uh, toxic butterflies because they, they are, tend to be brightly colored with warning coloration anyway. So, and, it, and it's nearly always the females that do the mimicry. We think because they've got more need of protection of the, of the eggs that they carry. Males, of course, once they've mated, they've done their job and they are, this, uh, what's the word, disposable, but the females need to hang on to their eggs. Um, some of the, some of the, um, the, the, the whites, the, the purple tips and so on, the, the males are purple, black and white, and the males are orange, the females are orange, black and white, both brightly colored, but different. Um, we think um, some of the lepidochrysops and the, um, the opals, for instance, some of the little lysenids, there is sexual signaling. The males tend to be much more brightly colored and iridescent, and the, the females tend to be duller with less bright colors. And the males are in your face, they're territorial, they fly around, they fly like aerial battles, where the females are are quiet and they hang around near the host plants. So there is an element of sexual signal, yes, in, in some butterflies, but it varies from group to group and species to species. Okay, fascinating. Uh, Peter Sharling's got an interesting question. I wonder if you have any insights. Um, he says that toxicity in birds is a lot less common than butterflies. Um, and there's only two examples, I think, of locally toxic birds being the common quail and spurwing goose. Um, do you have any idea why, why that might be? 
It's because it's been, birds are not birds. Are, sorry, I'm going to drink water here. Birds are not at the bottom of the tropic pyramid like butterflies and moths are. They feed on plants, and with birds feed on insects and, and so on. And, uh, and for a bird to get to, to take on toxins from a butterfly that eats doesn't really make a lot of sense. But we know there's been a there's been a, a arms war been going on since well 100 million years between flowering plants and Lepidoptera, where, uh, where the plants actually develop toxins not to scare off Lepidoptera, but to scare off herbivores. A lot of plants have got toxins, develop toxins to become unpleasant to uh, to large mammal or reptile herbivores. And the butterflies, of course, and the moths, whose caterpillars use the plants, they, they've, they've taken to utilizing the, the plant toxins in the, and they metabolize them into their own body. And they use those to scare off birds. A bird will come along and, oh, that's an interesting looking butterfly. I'll grab that and eat it. Ugh, tastes nasty. And, you know, the... The sort of common um, what's the word assumption is that once once a bird has had a nasty experience, like trying to eat a bit of acria, along comes a false acria, and it's bigger and it's more even more brightly coloured, and it would rather steer clear. And birds aren't stupid; we know this; they do learn. But there's a big but, and we know that this has been going a long time. And certain bird species, as Peter well knows, love to feed on acria caterpillars, even though they're full of cyanide. It's almost it's almost like we humans do a similar thing with chilies with um, with um, the, the the capsaic in, in in chilies which is there as a, as a as a herbivore scarer we eat it because we love it it actually it actually gives us gives us uh, pleasant feelings of uh, you know it's not just the heat of, the heat from the chili it's also it also has certain medicinal benefits as well so we animals have learned to live on certain uh, plant toxins and to, and to use them for our own use. So it's no surprise that insects have done the same thing. They've been around a lot longer than we have. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, a question from Dave Caulfield. Um, he says he's aware. Of, yeah. Uh, he's aware of several UK species of butterfly moving north. Um, are, are you aware of any other sort of global warming related or climate change related effects on butterflies in South Africa? We think we think so. Yes, it's the jury is still out on whether it's 100 percent due to global warming. But the, the citizen science programs are doing like Lipima. One of the first things they picked up was that the white barred Caraxes, Caraxes brutus, was turning up in places like Somerset West and Cape Town. We thought, hmm, is that is that climate related? Then we found out that number one, the municipalities were planting mahogany because it's an indigenous tree and they look nice and, and they imported plants from Natal and they were infested with caterpillars and those caterpillars hatched out to become butterflies, but they were able to withstand the cold of the Cape. So obviously the, the warmer weather did help. Um, we've also found the, um, the Akara acria butterfly is moving south and west. Uh, the caterpillars feed on, on passiflorasi and typically your, your uh, adenias and, and so on, your, your toxic vines that you get in the in the forest like the mango, mamba green stem. But they've moved on to, on to edible uh, um, passion flower, grenadilla. And now I think just recently somebody's found them in Nyster, which is unheard of. That could well be, be uh, uh, climate change related. And then Freddie, the, uh, the, the famous um, uh, Caraxes Wakefieldy, the forest queen, that never used to be found south of Durban. And even in Durban, it was a mega rarity. And then now it's turning up in Port Edward. Uh, I think somebody's seen one south of there now. The, the caterpillars feed on on on, on the Dimbolia oblongifolia, the, the June soapberry, which is found all the way up and down the coast. I think it's found as far south as Alexandria Forest. So technically, that butterfly could spread all the way down to the to the Western Cape um, on, 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 on warm on warm climate. And we know that the, the Earth's climate has changed. Um, on a mega scale, many, many times in the past. This is what we're going through now is nothing unusual. And in fact, I'm not a climate change skeptic, a skeptic, but if you read up on, on I just finished reading a book called The Story of Earth and Life. Um, we've been in, we are in an ice age. We've been in an ice age for the last 11 million years since the, the Drake Channel opened and split South America from Antarctica and the um, basements of Panama formed and cutting off Epis C. So the engine of, of, of the heat engine that drove the, the world's climate and, and pressure systems has, has been choked off. And the ice caps on the, on, on the poles have only been there for about 10, 12 million years. And this cycling of hot and cold 
is, is, is fairly recent. And it, and it goes from, from being very, very heavily frozen up to being almost no ice caps. But before then, there weren't any ice caps at all. So what did the butterflies do then? I guess they were, they were around. Um, we know, for instance, that the, the um, that blue spotted Caraxes, that only split from its parent species, which was a common ancestor with the forest king Caraxes, that split, guess what, 11 million years ago. And they know this from mitochondrial DNA. Um, so, so that butterfly has been following the climate for an awfully long time. So this is something that was natural and it's going to carry on happening. Uh, and it, but it's interesting to see how, how climate changes and, and, and they're able to, it's, it's how they, they, we've, we've stood being wiped out by climate change in the past. Fascinating, Steve. Thank you. Um, another very insightful question from Eleanor Mary tonight. Um, would butterflies see the same colours that we do, or do we know that they have a different colour range or perception to humans? Oh, very definitely, yes. Um, uh, certain butterflies, like the Pyridae, the white ones, uh, they can see they can see in the ultraviolet. And if, if you actually take a um, one of your, like even even a, a Pioneer Caper White or one of these other ones, if you photograph them in UV. They've got brilliant markings that you can't see with your eye, but they're visible in in, in ultraviolet. Even some of these iridescent butterflies, like like the um, the common diadem, and, and in Europe you get the purple emperor. That purple is not easily visible unless the sun's shining in a certain direction. But if you shoot them with a flash gun, which took out a lot more white, um, uh, longer, um, uh, sorry, shorter wave light than than the sun. Then it picks up the UV and it shines, and you get a brilliant uh, iridescent effect because that, that artificial flashlight actually does something to change the butterfly's color. And of course, there must be a reason why they got different colors. They actually can see. Uh, they don't do it through rods and cones like we mammals do. They, they've got a little uh, their compound eyes. They've got things called obatidia, and we know that they've got different ones with different light sensitivities. So they can definitely see in the color. That's why they're different colors. They, they're using perceptual signaling. They must be able to see in the color range, like like a lot of birds can. I imagine also, um, you know, like certain um, nectivorous birds uh, detect different uh, patterns on flowers and things like that. Yep. So yep. I guess the, the butterflies are probably doing something similar there too. Yeah, you get, you get a lot of flowers have got these nectar trails that lead down into the throat of the flower, which are there to guide the insect's eye onto where, onto where the nectar source is. Yeah. yeah. Um, Shashi Kant uh, has a question here about she, she's heard that uh, butterflies are an indication of um, ecological health and are used as sort of an indicator um, do you have anything to share on this about how people use butterflies as, as indicator species well yeah that's actually very a very sort of pertinent question because right now of course we're everybody's worried about the state of the of ecology now you may have heard of the insect apocalypse with, uh, with insect numbers crashing all over the world. Reports of in Germany, I think numbers are 70% down on where they were. And of course, butterflies and moths are no, are no, no, ex no exception. The, the numbers in, in the UK in particular are, are definitely, definitely falling. And the, the most sort of obvious um, um, culprit is that these new uh, synthetic insecticides, these uh, uh, neonicotinoids, and, uh, and pyrethroids, which are which have been man-made chemicals, which have been developed to potentiate the, the toxic principle in nicotine or in pyrethrin, which kills insects. So what they've done is they 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 worked out what it does that, to make that chemical so so nasty to an insect, and they just amplified it. And they they're using these things even though they know that what they're doing to the insects, and and it's the, the height of of irresponsibility. And, and in fact, I gave a talk the other day uh, to, to Kirst, Kirsten Bosch. I don't know, maybe if some of you were there, uh, we were talking about this very thing about gardeners have got a huge responsibility because farmers have kind of got an excuse. You know, they, 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 they have to grow food. You know, they, they need to fight battles to, to stop things from eating their, um, you know, their, their plants. But the fact is that but monoculture started when farming started before. Before the you know, sort of revolution in farming in, in the Middle East, people were hunters and gatherers, and they didn't worry about growing vast numbers of plants. If you plant a monoculture, there's going to be an insect somewhere that uses that plant as a host plant. The minute you plant a great bunch of, of clivias in your garden, for instance, then all the moths that feed on clivias are suddenly going to smell that a thousand times more easily, and they're going to come to your garden and lay eggs and eat your clivias. And the same thing goes of 
we have all the farm plants as well. And some of the more modern farming people are realizing that you've got to rewild. You've got to you've got to use natural um, ways of planting um, certain plants which 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 the uh, the, the um, insects don't like near your crop. And that's been happening now for an awfully long time. And there's a lot of rewilding. Um, there's a, in, in the UK, you've got uh, um, you've got butterfly conservation is, is running a, a program for uh, there's a place called Nepa State down in the south where they they've taken the farm and completely rewilded it. They're not using pesticides at all. In America, they've got the pollinator friendly alliance. All over the world now, gardeners in particular don't need to grow food like a farmer does. Uh, you don't need monocultures. You don't need to plant exotic flowers that the local insects can't eat. So plant locally indigenous, don't use pesticides. And, 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 and also, it's not just the butterflies and moths. It, because of where they are in, in, the, in the ecosystem, things like wasps, or insects like wasps, and, uh, and of course birds, they all feed on butterflies and their, and their larvae, and moths as well. And they all feed on one another. So if you've got a, a healthy garden where you've got lots of wasps flying around eating caterpillars, you've got spiders, um, hunting the butterflies, you've got you've got wasps killing the spiders, you've got birds like cuckoos eating the caterpillars, you've got all these different food webs going on in your garden. The more of those you've got, the more biodiversity you've got. And right now, with COP15, the emphasis is on measuring biodiversity. It's not just species richness, that's one aspect of it. It's how complex is your food web, how, how resilient is your ecosystem to, to damage. And, and that's going to be the big challenge for the for the 21st century, as we know, and there's a lot, there's a huge amount of work going on by the United Nations and by governments all over the world. All the governments, our governments included, are signatories to COP15. And right now, there are there are uh, this latest thing with the with, um, City Nature Challenge, which has been run by Sanmi and INAT in South Africa. That is uh, part of the the global attempt to get a measure of our biodiversity, so we can see where it's good and where it's not so good. And it's all about using ordinary people taking photographs of things with their phones and cameras to measure the biodiversity and just get an idea, a baseline of how healthy we really are. So it's 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 and butterflies and moths because they're heli, they're really really visible and obvious in your face. Yeah, if you've got lots of butterflies in your garden, it's a pretty good clue you've got a healthy ecosystem. Yeah, so they are indicator species. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm in the... <laughs> I remember um, when I was doing my undergrad in ecology and evolution, the the textbook example of, of proof of evolution, or at least natural selection, was the pippid moths during the yep. industrial revolution, yep. and how they responded to to uh, to you know, environmental change. And if you want to just talk quickly through that, possibly so that was a, that's a moth of the. The family Geomet Geometry Day. It's one of the inchworm moths, and yeah, the natural wild Vistum betularia. Was, was a peppered, it was a black and white flecked colouring. And you occasionally got a melanic form. A lot, a lot of butterflies have got melanic forms as well. It's, it's not rare, um, but the butterflies are, you normally only see you know, one melanic form for every thousand normal ones you see. But in the north of England, when they had smoke stacks belching uh, carbon all over the place, and I, I used to live in the north of England, and stone, I used to think stone was black. It's only when they started sandblasting them in the 1970s, I realised it was golden honey colored stone underneath. And then they had the, the smoke abatement, abatement tax came in and, and you weren't allowed to, to burn smoky coal anymore. The moth reacted to that. Every tree in England, its bark went black. So a white moth with black speckles was easily visible to a bird and got eaten. Whereas a black moth was invisible and didn't get eaten. And, and what they found was over the space of a few generations, it didn't take long, most of those moths were black with the odd speckly one. When they went the other way and, and, and they banned um, heavy smoky fuels and, they, and, and all of a sudden the trees were covered in natural lichens again, it went the other way and the black moths become rare. So that's, that is evolution in, in action. It's a really, really good example, yeah. Um, all right, so Ime van Koller is asking, how many years of experience uh, does it take in, in, in your sort of what you've seen of, of people getting into butterflies and moths to become reasonably comfortable with the identification? Generally, it, once, you, once you know the various families, and even with moths, which can be really difficult, it's not difficult to get to the point where you can recognize an emperor moth or a hawk moth or a caraxes butterfly or a period. It's, you know, with, with the average textbook, you can actually 
make the discernment fairly easily. Um, and when it comes to setting the difference between the, the, the more brightly colored or, or, or brightly marked ones, it's not that difficult. It's like with birds. When you start getting into the warblers and sticklers and things like that, it's when it gets to be fun. Um, of course, the other thing is it's not just that, the colors of the adults as well. You've, you've got another aspect with, uh, with butterflies and moss, and that's, that's the larval forms. And that's somewhere, something where we, we, know, we knew until recently very little indeed. And what we're finding is we've got kids up and down the country watching butterflies lay eggs and rearing those things through to adult. But I've got a 10-year-old lives up the road from me, watched the mother of pearl laying an egg in my garden, took the egg home and reared it through. So he's now more expert on butterflies than I was when I was 10 years old, that's for sure. So you can learn very quickly. It's one of the most fascinating things there is. That's great. Um, quick one from Eleanor Mary as well. Um, how many species do we have in, in South Africa? The latest count, I think it's up at around about 675. It, it, kind of, it kind of fluctuates up and down a little bit because every now and again, some, something gets lumped and something gets split. And right now, there's a huge amount of work going on on taxonomy. There's a lot of work being done with DNA. Um, but yeah, we, we were, I think, down to 671 at one point. And now a couple of new species have, have been either described or ones that have been lumped in the past have been re-split again. Uh, you ask any of the lepidopterists, and then the birders are going through the same thing as well. And of course, the worst thing is as well is that Lepsoc has started on a on a common name um, re reassignment program because we realised that you know butterflies in South Africa had the common names are very different to the ones you get uh, elsewhere. And I had tourists come out here and say, "Why are you calling that a long a, a pea blue? To us, that's a long tail." We said, well, you know, it's long tail blue to us in South Africa as well. But if you go to India or Kenya, it's a pea blue. You know, what are we going to call it? And harmonizing like that, a lot of names were, were named after people. You had swanapools, blue swanapools, brown swanapools, this swanapools, that. That means nothing to an amateur. You know, they know, might know who David Swanapool was, but why that particular blue butterfly is, is called swanapools and not somebody else's is a mystery. So what we're trying to do is be, become descriptive about why it's a particular shade of blue or why it's found this sort of thing to make it easy for people to learn. But the right now, yeah, around about, it's around about 670 species, give or take, you know, three or four. Moths, we don't know. It's on the conservative estimate, it's 15 times as many moth species. On the wild estimates, because of the difficulties in setting species apart, because they tend to be identical, it's as many as 30,000 species. Who knows? It's it's um, almost maybe a more maybe more lepidoptera species than beetle species. We actually there's work going on all the time. It's 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 a massive field to study. It's very exciting stuff. Hmm. Amazing. Um, last two questions. Um, first one, just quickly, you mentioned the R seven. Uh, what other photography gear do you use to produce your fantastic images? I started out in the nineteen. 19- Early 80s with a Practica MTL3 with a, with a Zeiss 50 millimeter lens and extension tubes. And believe it or not, a couple of the pictures in my first edition of my book with ones that I took, I never got a better photograph than the one I got with that. I then graduated from Nikon and I started using an FA, which has got TTL flash and a ring flash, and I had a, a 55 millimeter micro Nikkor. And then I graduated to a 105. Then I went digital, got a D80. And then I then I got the I got the Zig with Nikon and switched to Canon because it, because Nikon would not make an uh, an MPE65. All those egg photographs are done with an MPE65 and a sliding plate and a stacking rig. And uh, and then then I when I went to Canon I, I got a 300 millimeter f4 which is far better for butterflies than the 2.8 and costs about a quarter as much or less. I used that with a 1.4 times converter and that for a long time was my go-to uh, setup for photographing butterflies and very little could escape you because you could be a metre and a half away and get a butterfly the size of your fingernail big enough in the frame to see the individual frames. The R7 with the 100 to 400 millimetre macro with the with the 1.4 time converter. Just I just and I even just sort of just scratch the surface of what that thing can do. I mean, you, you can focus on a dragonfly in the middle of a PT Nature Reserve's pond from I don't know 20 30 metres away when it's just a speck in the middle of the viewfinder. Shoot it. And then when you screen it, you can actually see the veins on the wings. I mean, that's just incredible. Okay, it's, 50, it's 33 megapixels, I know. It's the crop sensor. That lens is it's just amazing. And, and, and the, the, the focusing is so quick. I know people who are using the, the, the bigger 
full frame mirrorlesses. And I, I know Callan uses a, uses the Olympus mirrorless, and he uh, I haven't even started to play with um, with the rolling shutter yet. The um, what they call it, a, a raw burst. I, uh, I know it can be done, and I've seen Callan do it, but right now I'm, I'm busy. I haven't even learned how to do all the different programmings in the autofocus. I know it's possible to have three or four different autofocus modes, and yeah. you're constantly fiddling around with these buttons and wheels while you're while you're focusing on a butterfly, deciding what's the best combination of uh, exposure and focus to use. It's just it's incredible. So I'm really in love with the thing. It's uh, I'm a bit scared of it as well, actually. <laughs> mm. well, but you don't have to have a fancy camera. You can get away with. I mean, when I was a kid. I wasn't very good at it, but I, I used to use an old Kodak box brownie to photograph catapult on black and white film. So, yeah, it, 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 it's, um, it's, it's really how much passion you've got, really. The tools are just getting more, more what's the word, uh, sophisticated. But uh, if you, once you get to know their habits, habits and, and, and what they do, um, you need to be able to creep up on them. Uh, not so much with an R7. You can stand away from them and get a picture. But when it was 55 millimeter lenses, you you needed to be really good at uh, walking on your knees and being very quiet indeed. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing where technology is taking us. And I think I'd like mm -hmm. to just um, end on that aspect. There's a comment from Rick Nuttall, who I think is a friend of yours. Um, mm -hmm. He's a Hello, Rick. the show as well. He's been on twice. Um, Rick has uh, said he, he's seen a few comments in the chat box about photographs and and your fantastic photographs and also what to do with butterfly photographs. And he suggested, I just uh, let you finish on an appeal for people to contribute to citizen science aspects like Lepinap and iNaturalist. Maybe yeah. just like talk yeah. about the yeah. importance of that. Yeah, that, that is, I mean, one of the, again, plug for the R7. The nice thing about it is if you've got, if you've got a phone and you've got iNat and you've got a GPS on your phone, you can actually Bluetooth link your camera to your phone and every time you take a photograph, the, uh, the GPS coordinates go into the uh, into the EXIF. So when you when you put your your camera onto your computer and download the pictures, you don't even have to worry about uh, about trying to trying to remember where you photographed it. We started out oof, back in the early, I think it was it, it was first rooted back in the late nineties, uh, and then Silver Missionero finally managed to nag Les Underhill uh, to do a butterfly version of the bird map, and that started up, and it was. Originally, it was done on paper, um, like the original uh, Saba. And then, of course, digital cameras came out. And purely through serendipity, my first book came out. And it was really well-timed because it just started selling like hotcakes. People were running around photographing butterflies. And, and then they started sending digital photographs into Les. And then they had a reptile map going. It wasn't but Lepi Map wasn't the first virtual museum. A reptile map was. So they got Lepi Map going. And then, well, the rest is history. It's gone... It's just gone, you know, from one extreme to the other. Uh, Lepi Map is is, uh, is 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 great because it's it's curated by experts. Unlike the original iSpot wasn't. It was it, it was really done by sort of a gaming mechanism where the the, the more votes an ID got, the more chances it was of being being right, which was not statistically very valid. But uh, um, but it was a way of of, of identifying something. Whereas Lepi Map. He knew if somebody identified it, the guy knew what he was talking about. And it's people are still using it now. One of the one of the great things about the news, the new, the new iNaturalist is that they they've realized that the identifier community is more important than the actual observers. And there's a massive amount of social media stuff going on between the various, you've got all the top experts in the world on everything from birds to, to butterflies to fly, even really abstruse things like weird types of of rare flies, as somebody somewhere will pick up that taxon. And I mean, I, I photographed a, a, a tachinid fly in my garden, which is a beautiful thing. It looked like a Klingon spacecraft in miniature. And I put it on iNAP thinking nobody's going to identify this thing. Bingo, a guy in Germany latched onto it and was doing his gum saying, Where the hell did you photograph that? You know, that thing's only ever been seen twice before. Wow. <laughs> and it turns out that you can follow a taxon. And a taxon, of course, can mean anything from a subspecies to, to a, a family of birds. It's still a taxon. You can say, I want to follow ducks. I want to follow tachinid like, flies. And anytime, anybody, anywhere in the world, and you can follow them in Africa or globally, whatever. And then every time somebody um, goes near one of those uh, identifications, you get a notification for your INAT and you go in and you identify it. And these guys are competitive. Eh? 
they're, they're all <laughs> vying for, for, for two things, number of identifications and accuracy as well. And I'm, I've been doing dragonflies for a while. Uh, I'm, I'm expert grade with butterflies. Uh, with moths, I'm sort of sub-experts getting there, as they call it. But on flowers, I'm a maverick. I get it wrong as often as I get it right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, excuse I'm me. Sure. And now they're running things like these, these, these bio blitzers and, uh, and city nature challenges where, and it's all to do with this, with the effort that the world is making to, to measuring the, the alpha and beta, beta biodiversity around the world. Because not only are they doing actual identification species, but look at interactions as well. I photographed a, a gecko eating a, a moth, um, a sundowner moth, and I was able to log both the gecko and the moth, and the interaction between them is also in INAT as well. And there were people, people studying that. And the caterpillar rearing group, which sun, when they found a caterpillar root, uh, feeding on a plant, they identified the plant and they identified the caterpillar. And if it's ant associated, they identified the ant as well. And the whole thing goes into, a, into a, um, a, an interactions database. And it's all available to scientists around the world who are studying these things all the time for various reasons. And, and But that all started with Dio Les Underhill uh, and the guys at the ADU. Uh, they, they started a fire that's just, just sort of burning all over the world. Now. It really is amazing. Because it was amazingly, you know, rewarding to be part of it in the early days like that. Because, uh, you know, to see, wow, if we did this, we could do that, you know. And as the technology has moved on, we got more and more powerful. Um, artificial intelligence, for instance. I mean, INAT has got a thing called computer vision. And that computer vision, I know now, because I've seen it do it, can identify even, even difficult butterflies and moths. And it normally gets it right the first or second time. You don't need a human being involved. A bit scary, really. <laughs> yeah, I, I enjoy that um, for, for text that I don't know so well, whether it's mm. butterflies or dragonflies or flowers or even things like moths or mushrooms. Um, mm. but, I'm, but I'm curious enough to want to know what it is because... That's how a lot of us are. I just load it up onto INET, see what the AI says, and then put it out there and see what the experts say. And it's quite satisfying and interesting to learn that way as you go. And then you start recognizing them when you see them again. And yeah, that, it all contributes as well, as you say. So it's important data. So please do go and put up your photographs on iNaturalist and try it out. It's, a, and it's, it's a communication thing as well, Andrew. I mean, what we find is you've got a lot of communication between the identifiers and the observers. And I'm, I'm running a few projects for the company I, I used to work for full time. Uh, each one of their sites around the world has got an INAP project. And we're actually measuring uh, all sorts of things, not just butterflies, but anything anybody sees. And what I said to them is, if you're battling of identifications or if you need to learn more, have a look at who's identifying things. And then go and you can message them through the, the INAP um, uh, medium. And you can say, hey, I see that you live just down the road from me and you, you, you identified this wasp for me. Will you come and give us a talk on wasps and how to identify them and what they, how important they are? And that's what they're doing. Our ladies in Croatia, they, they photographed a really rare spider on their site, and they got a local arachnologist to come and talk to them about spiders. Um, so it's, it's, it's an educational thing as well as a, um, a, a conservation thing. It's, it's just brilliant. It really is. Yeah, it's an incredible resource. Um, so I'm going to round things out there. We've, we've gone well past where we usually end, but it's been so fascinating. I didn't want to stop. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. It's, it's been incredibly insightful and some nice uh, new and different uh, material to what we, what we used to. So it's nice to change it up every now and again. And uh, there's a chat room full of, of compliments and gratitude for you to read through there, Steve. So thank you for spending yes, some time with us tonight. Been a great audience. I've seen some of the chats coming through, and it was it was a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for thanks for attending, everybody. All right, thank you, everyone, and um, that's it from us tonight. Join us again next uh, well next fortnight, and uh, we'll have uh, Cassie Carstens, who's going to be talking about birding in Hogsback. Cassie's uh, one of the newest staff members at Bird Life South Africa. Some of you may know him from the Cape Parrot Project, and he's now joined Bird Life South Africa as our Secretary Bird Conservation Project Officer. So. Very excited to see what Cassie has to say and share about um, the birding gem that is Hogback. Thank you everyone for joining. Have a wonderful evening. Stay safe and we'll see you next time. Good night. Thanks everybody. Good night. Mm -hmm.